Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to ARC's fourth web window. Today, ARC's Vice President, Valentin De Leo, prepared a presentation on the impact of smart manufacturing and industrial IoT and operations management. My name is Anne. I'm the moderator for today's session. So without any further delay, I would like to pass over the word to our expert, Valentine. So Valentine, uh, do you expect important changes in, uh, in the MES domain related to the Industry 4.0? Yes, Anne, I think that's a very good question. And um, I, I like the way you ask it, because Industry 4.0 is in the mind of many uh, people. And MES is also in the mind of many people. Now. As you see, I have written the title of this presentation slightly differently. I would like to expand a little bit beyond Industry 4.0 and beyond MES, and I will I will start with with explaining why. Um, the first thing is that although Industry 4.0 is a very important initiative in the industrial IoT space, there are many, many other ones that are also significant. Um, and many of those initiatives, I have listed here a few, uh, Smart Manufacturing Leadership Coalition is uh, more regionally important in the US, but I expect they will also become important for the industry elsewhere in the world. We have the catapults in the UK, we have the Industrial Internet Consortium, we have uh, Industrie du Futur in France, we have uh, the EU's Horizon 2020, and so on and so on. And these have all their different components or elements that they are built of. And many of those elements overlap. They don't have exactly the same goals, but many of those elements overlap. So what I propose is to um, look a little bit uh, into two examples of initiatives to show you that these elements overlap and then to focus on the elements and then from the elements try to determine what the impact on MES or operations management is. So this is the first example, Industry 4.0. Um, when you read the documents written by the platform Industry 4.0, which is the organization that defines Industry 4.0, you will see that one of the most important aspects is to use more real-time data from sensors and, and other sources um, and digital information in um, three types of integration. The first type is integrating value change across companies. Um, that means manufacturing companies, raw material companies, logistics companies, distribution companies, um, and so on. So connecting them together and making sure their integration is digital and close to real time. The second axis is um, along the, the process or the product life cycle. And Industry 4.0 advocates to use more and more digital information and to make sure that the engineering and the other technical work, such as maintenance and operations, become one end-to-end -end, uh, process. And it starts before a plant exists and before a product is, exists and it takes until the plant is uh, deconstructed or the, or the product is recycled. And one of the, the aspects from that could be that production systems or MES could be self-generated based on the information that the uh, design engineers put together. So we, we wouldn't have to engineer the MES anymore. We could just derive it as a result from the engineering information. And when the plant is changed or updated during its life, um, this would also update the digital design information in the MES. So we get less interfaces, we get less disruptions, and we have less human intervention, and our MES keeps up to date 
as well as our asset lifecycle management information. The third axis is the vertical integration, which goes from an order coming in um, at the enterprise level and then the distribution over the manufacturing assets and then at the end the execution on the production line and then back gathering the information during the manufacturing and playing that back to the enterprise where it can be distributed to distribution channels or to smart customers. One of the, the, the very innovative aspects of this vertical integration, um, especially in Industry 4.0, is the self-organization and the self-optimization of the production assets. So you can imagine on the work floor the different robots talking to each other and organizing themselves, or different equipment being changed uh, out between lines and so on. So this is an innovative aspect that came up uh, by people discussing Industry 4.0. So these three axes of integration between companies along the life cycle and from the enterprise down to the production environment and back. And the interpretation of all this is that this could lead to smarter production, that means high precision products, high quality products, smart products, products that know something about themselves, for example, and more individualized production based on the, the needs of individual clients. It would also imply green production, sustainable production, such that production can also be integrated with areas of leisure, areas of agriculture, and areas of where people live, so that it doesn't uh, create pollution or other environmental footprint. So green production and urban production are, are very close and are also ideas associated with Industry 4.0. Now let's compare this to another initiative, which is the Smart Manufacturing Leadership Coalition, the other side of the ocean. Industry 4.0 is originating from Germany and very popular in Europe and other parts of the, of the world. Smart manufacturing leadership comes from the US. And uh, if you look at the diagram, you will also see that supply chains are an aspect, efficient supply chains are an aspect of SMLC, um, as well as the vertical integration and the plant-wide optimization, and also the sustainable production. So it is just to show that these different initiatives, although they go different ways and they have different types of test beds, they have many elements in common. In this case, uh, as well, the horizontal supply chains, the vertical integration and sustainability. So if we zoom out a little bit <clears throat> and don't focus on individual initiatives, but look at the more generic representation of this field, then we could say that smart manufacturing is a more general way of saying that we want to make manufacturing um, better and more agile and more efficient and more sustainable. And we do that with two main uh, means. And the first mean, means is uh, what I call advanced manufacturing, which is in the area of science or engineering. And the second area of improvement is in applying manufacturing technologies, and specifically smart manufacturing technologies. An industrial Internet of Things is one of smart manufacturing, uh, smart manufacturing technologies that we could apply. However, there are many different ones. And i show you that on the next slide. So I'm giving you some examples here of components that we encounter in the different initiatives that I can then organize according to advanced manufacturing or smart manufacturing technologies. And in advanced manufacturing, I find, for example, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, we call that sometimes. 
or chemical nanostructures, which is very advanced chemistry, or advanced forming, which can create very, very thin forms out of materials. Um, new uh, processes that are much more sustainable. And uh, what we will talk about a little bit later, modularization of production processes. So these have all to do with science and engineering. And then in the smart manufacturing technologies, we are more in the field of automation and, and yes, and you see there the industrial Internet of Things where we use the Internet to connect our uh, manufacturing assets. But there are many more aspects such as um, sensors that can work in very harsh environments that we didn't have before or sensors that can be produced uh, in very large numbers uh, very cheaply so that we can use a lot of them and get a very detailed picture of our um, production assets. We can think of advanced modeling and simulation. I will come back to that later on as well. We can think of smart manufacturing technologies that existed already in the past, such as model predictive control or lean manufacturing that can now be applied to different industry domains. For example, lean used to be used in discrete manufacturing and is now also applied in um, process manufacturing. Um, <clears throat> we can look into self-organizing plants, as Industry 4.0 suggests, seamless asset information lifecycle management or integrated engineering, as Mr. Tauchnitz uh, called it um, 10 years ago, and also the real-time integration of value chain networks, and modular automation, which goes with modular production. And so these, all these different elements um, are taken from these different initiatives and have or have not impact on MES. Now until here I've been talking about MES and everyone or many, many people still speak about MES. However, I want to point out that um, we also use the term operations management which is a little bit more complete from a formal standpoint and it fits very well with the ISO 95 standard that describes in detail the different activities in the manufacturing space for IT. So um, even if we use MES, uh, we should think operations management and we, we should think of everything that is comprised in the ISO 95 <coughs> standard in terms of activities. Now let's have a look how these different components impact MES. So there are actually, as you can see from the red sentences, many, many that impact MES. And so what I would like to, uh, to do next is to look how they impact different industry domains. Okay, Val, and what are the most important impacts on the discrete industry? So what do you think? So let's, um, let's look at discrete then first. Um, so I repeat um, briefly that the, the, the vision of uh, Industry 4.0 or the classical industrial IoT vision is these self-organizing, self-optimizing production lines and plants. That's, that's the way we, we tend to dream of them. And they can handle customization and individualization. So when I buy a car, I would like to define uh, what the color is of the car, um, how many doors it has, if it has a, a sunroof, uh, what the color of the, of the seats will be, and so on. And if, if everyone is capable of defining his own car, that means that the production facilities must be able to execute all these individualized uh, orders. So it must be very flexible in quantity and in terms of configuration. Now, what does that imply for MES? I believe that radio communication is probably not required inside the factory. 
Sometimes we have these uh, idealized pictures where different production equipment talk to each other over Wi-Fi. But I believe that's probably not necessary because we can have the traditional uh, wiring or even Ethernet um, that connect these different equipment and that enable them to talk to each other. So if you look at the picture on the right side, you can see that in the past we would think of a linear production line with different workstations and that we built for example a car um, it would go uh, linearly uh, through uh, the plant and each workstation would build another car. In the future we would expect that if one workstation is very occupied or has a little bit longer production time that another one that is free would take over and that very spontaneously the ones will start helping the others and there may be one that uh, may be stopped uh, temporarily for maintenance and that another one will uh, will take over and so on and all this will be based on self-organization. Well if that is the case then that means that the, the workflow through the plant cannot be hardwired, basically. It, be, it, it means that um, we should be capable, or that we should expect from our MES that it can dynamically re-optimize and reroute through different workstations, maybe even through different plants, what we have to build. Um, and that means that each workstation should be able to be primed with setup parameters that will tell it uh, what is needed in order to make a certain object or a certain product. We can then think of the MES as an overarching coordinating instance and um, that will then on the fly um, configure uh, the, the detailed workflows based on this result of its optimization. So it's sort of an auto-configured MES. Um, <clears throat> Let's say that within the plant, other than that, there will not be major changes. However, we, sh we do expect major changes outside of the plant. As the products become more and more intelligent and connected, um, this means that our uh, production system, our MES, our operations management, must also be able to connect to the product. And um, we probably will also use um, smart tools, so it will also need to connect to smart tools. And outside the plant, it will need to connect to, um, to the supply chain. To a certain extent, this is already reality, and um, as an example, Volkswagen already produces any model on any line, in any order, anywhere in the world today. So they are already very, very flexible in quantity and configuration and self-optimizing. Um, <clears throat> if we look at the picture that I took from the ISO 95 um, standard, where we imagine at high level, level four, um, our planning and scheduling, and at the low level we imagine uh, several plants. And if we want this self-organization to happen at the plant floor, that means that we cannot impose from the high level exactly on which equipment and exactly on which line a product is going to be made. And so we will have to specify the work orders in a more generic way. We cannot say cell one in plan three. We will have to say the cell of this type in that type of production line. And then send that work order down and expect that the, the production plant can make its own decisions. And this means for MES that um, the MES must much must be much more um, must be written or be organized in much more in generic terms um, and must be much less hardwired. 
And this is poss possible based on the current standards that we have, such as ISO 95. However, it may require a major overhaul, a major project to redo the MES in much more generic terms. So this is one of the consequences for, for operations management that we can expect when um, smart manufacturing and in industry 4.0 become implemented in the discrete industry. Um, <clears throat> in this picture we show um, how we imagine or actually how we observe already that uh, the smart production environment changes. And you see um, where I have my, my mouse over here that there is a smart production module. So this is really the, the centerpiece. It's the, it's the manufacturing. And then we have all kinds of um, smart work components such as smart carriers and we have smart components that we can talk with and we can have smart logistics and we have smart workers which are connected with our smart tools using augmented reality and uh, we have a connected supply chain again with connected logistics servers and at the end of the chain we have the smart consumers and at the other hand um, we see that the, the smart production module is connected to um, the smart enterprise with uh, smart and connected third-party services so there is much more connection around the plant uh, and also in the plant. And um, as this becomes more complex, we need to adapt our MES and operations management, as we said, and we need to adapt our asset management. We need to take care of mobility and enhanced worker connectivity. And another aspect is that we will see uh, more analytics applications being used also inside manufacturing and therefore in the operations management space. Um, <clears throat> briefly on, on this slide I uh, depict the extension um, that is proposed by the uh, reference architecture uh, model for industry 4.0. It is built on ISA 88 and ISA 95 and it is extended um, to the connected product at, at the low side and to field devices and at the high side to the connected supply chain. So we see that this emerging landscape will also have its impact on extensions of uh, the standards that we are used to use. So this will evolve as well. Here you see an example. Um, <clears throat> this example exists since, uh, since a few years. It is uh, a pilot of industrial IoT that has been built um, by Intel with the help of Mitsubishi. And what they do is um, that over internet they connect at, uh, at very high speeds information about the production and they analyze it with an analytics application that can tell the production if the quality is still on spec or not. And if it, is, and if it isn't, then what needs to be done to, uh, to do maintenance to get the production back on spec. So really it is an advanced quality um, application. It is 100% related to industrial production and so it is in the operations management domain or MES if you wish. And it is really built as an add-on. The usual production system is still in place and it is just added on top of what was already there. So this is one example of how production environments evolve by small incremental steps. It is possible to add new technology using internet or not, that is a choice, and using additional new technology such as, as analytics. This is a, an example of discrete industry, so I wanted to show it in this section. Yes, great. Thank you for that detailed example. Very great. Interesting. 
And how do you see MES evolves in the batch and hybrid industry as well? Well, in the batch and hybrid industries, there are many uh, similar requirements, um, but there is something going on very fundamental in parallel in uh, the process technology. Remember I talked about advanced manufacturing? Well, this is an example. We call it modular process technology, and um, it uh, has resulted from uh, um, a common uh, industrial and uh, um, research stimulation project from the EU that is called FV Factory. And uh, the result of that is that plants are being considered and built as modules. And these modules can be sort of bolted together very quickly. And these are at a very small scale, so they are very small plants, and uh, these small plants, these mini plants, they can be built in containers, and therefore they become mobile. So you can move them to an optimum location uh, whenever you need. And uh, since they are built of these little modules, you can actually change them very quickly, and uh, for example, exchange a reactor module and make suddenly another product with it. Um, and some of these modules are modular themselves. So this is a very fundamental change that is going on in the life sciences, um, the fine and specialty chemicals, uh, partially in the food and beverage industry as well. And it um, creates additional requirements to the operations management systems that need to control these modular operations. And the trends that is very often spoken about now is modular automation. It is plug and produce. Basically, I plug in my module and I start producing right away without having to do much integration. Another term that is used very often is state-based control. So I want to explain that a little bit in the, in the next few slides. And here you see an example of a more module uh, that has been uh, rolled into um, a production facility, so the, the, um, the production line is not bigger than that. So they are docking it into a production site. Um, <clears throat> the vision for modular production is that we can place these different modules next to each other and that we don't have to uh, scale up a plant as we used to do in the past where we would create a very large version of a smaller plant that we had um, already developed with all the difficulties that uh, scale-up brings with us because um, mixing and heating a, a liquid uh, of uh, one liter or maybe thousand liter or ten thousand liters is um, requiring very different timescales, for example. So a very large process works in a much slower way than a small process. And that is the reason that these uh, lineups, as they are called, are so efficient, because it's much more efficient to produce um, small quantities very fast than a large quantity very slowly, to say it simply. So for MES, the requirements are similar as for discrete. That means you need to be able to re-optimize and reroute. Um, but in addition, lines can be changed very quickly. That means the assets are very flexible and they are not constant, and they can also be moved geographically. So that creates another challenge. Um, the products are probably not going to be smart. Um, a, a liter of glue or a liter of uh, lube oil will not be smart, but the container in which it would be sent could be become smart. That's a difference. And in terms of operations management of modular production, um, the Namur organization has identified two basic cases. One case is where black box modules are bolted together, are plugged together with coordination um, from the outside. 
using state-based control. We'll explain that a little bit more in the next page. But basically, we will tell to each different module that it will need to start producing now, or stop, or clean, or whatever. Or, that's the second option, that these different modules that are plugged in will be integrated with plant automation and MES, which is more like the traditional model. Uh, only it needs to be uh, done in a, in, a, in a faster way. Um, so that is the MES case. And then for inventory operations, we expect that uh, the supply chains will become much more volatile because there are many more things that will change compared to before. Uh, there are many, many more different options and therefore the, um, the effects of, uh, of changes in demand will have a major impact on, on the production systems. And so we will probably use more and more analytics applications for logistics that are very clever in optimization to be able to damp that volatility a little bit. So we will see both in production and in inventory operations differences in our systems in the in the in the in the future. Um, outside the company, we will may need even new organizations and new systems to coordinate with logistics providers and plant uh, information, plant cyber physical systems to make sure that we get the right um, uh, raw materials uh, when uh, one equipment signals that it uh, is in need of some new. Plug and produce state-based control actually has already been piloted in uh, the packaging industry in, in food and beverage. Um, and the model that is used there, you can, you can see the overview at the left side. Um, in these companies, uh, we split off a so-called line controller from the MES. So that is, we split the MES in two. We have the general functions uh, on top, and then we have this line controller that distributes um, the control of the states to the different production units or production modules. And each of these modules has a limited number of states, as I said before, so it can start, it can produce, it can stop, it can clean, and so on. And once uh, a production run is started, the line controller basically um, coordinates what the different modules have to do. And um, the standard that has been used to uh, make this integration is ISA 88, which is around since a long time already. And interestingly, it can also be used for this uh, very new smart manufacturing type of application. And we expect that it will also be used in the, in the future in, uh, in life sciences, specialty chemicals, and, and more and more in, in food uh, and, and beverage manufacturing, not only in packaging. So this is really uh, the, the, the major changes that we expect for um, batch and hybrid production. Okay, well, great, thank you. And for the continuously processing industries, what will happen there? Um, well, we've been talking with uh, many of the, of the different process industry players, and um, some are more involved, uh, more enthusiastic than others. Um, many f of them feel less urgency. They feel less concerned by smart manufacturing and uh, Industry 4.0 and, and similar initiatives. Although I think we should recognize that there is major potential and um, I think here the Smart Manufacturing Leadership Coalition in the U.S. Um, are uh, maybe a little bit ahead of us. Um, for example, in applying operational intelligence, but also in uh, next generation modeling and simulation and predictive control. Um, I'll show an operational intelligence example from Alcoa on the next slide. But uh, there are companies such as Tucson Group who 
embrace industry 4.0 and who um, put a lot of focus on the, the threefold integration that we've been speaking about. The horizontal, the vertical integration, and the integration across the, the process and product life cycle. Um, what we also believe will continue to develop and that remains in the operations management space is the scope and the scale of optimization. Today in the process industry is quite usual that there is um, advanced control and uh, real-time optimization that optimize a unit or sometimes a few units. Um, We've seen in, in, in oil and gas that the scope of optimization networks is, is increasing and we expect for the future that optimization in, in refining and petrochemicals, large continuous production plants, will continue to increase in scope and maybe we will optimize a full production site, maybe we will even optimize the scope of several sites in, in a region or, or a continent. So this is an area that we will believe um, there will be there will be major changes, and we also see in um, based on new generations of sensors that it is now possible to make measurements inside the production equipment, sometimes even at uh, in very harsh conditions, very high temperatures uh, that couldn't be made before, and so we can now also make more detailed models and based on those simulations we can make advanced uh, model-based predictive control so we expect a whole range of more advanced and more um, more powerful applications to to come on stream in the near future today um, companies with um, uh, many companies actually are applying operational intelligence. Basically, they connect their operations management systems, their MES systems, across the world in order for all the experts and all the operators to be able to share each other's knowledge and uh, to, 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 to see uh, in different plants uh, what is going on in real time. And from that information derive um, analytics. That means that if a plant is in a certain state, then automatically uh, recommendations come up that um, indicate to the operator or to the maintenance engineer what best could be done at that point in time. So Alcoa is, uh, is very much ahead of this, but there are other companies that are also connect their uh, plant information real time worldwide and that is what we call operational intelligence. So this is another domain that we will see growing in the in the process industries. Okay Val, so you were now just talking about today, but what can we expect further out in the future? Well what we can expect for the future um, We will, the, the first thing that we will happen is uh, similar to the example of um, Intel, where IoT is really an add-on on top of the existing production environment. This, in this picture you see an architecture that reflects that. Um, on the left lower corner you have the usual production uh, automation and uh, MES. Uh, with the usual automation uh, pyramid, which is connected through the usual uh, network to the different enterprise functions, engineering, maintenance, purchasing, and so on. And on top of that, we will see more and more the use of smart modules. For example, a pump may be upgraded with a smart module, and that smart module can discuss over internet with uh, the supplier, uh, maybe even with um, engineering or maintenance, um, and via the supplier it may be compared with uh, how this pump functions uh, in different plants, 
And so we can imagine that um, analytics applications will more and more give us indications when this uh, pump will need maintenance and how it can be operated uh, in an, an optimal way. This is more or less the, the architecture for add-on um, applications. Now far in the future, we expect something more similar to uh, this vision that I took from uh, Professor Walster, and who sees um, the production systems really completely built up of uh, service-oriented modules. And these service-oriented modules could be um, configured on the spot based on the requirements from the clients and from the production sites. Um, this is our, however, uh, it, is, it is very far away still. So in order to do this, we would have to really completely rebuild our um, production systems. But as I said before, we can start already reaping benefits from uh, smart manufacturing and industrial IoT and industry 4.0 uh, with some small step changes. But this is where it probably will go in the future. Now, if we think even some step further, then uh, we can start thinking beyond industrial applications. And we can easily imagine that at the end of the production chain, there is some product that will be used by uh, some smart user. And that smart user may have a smart car, and that smart car may uh, run into a smart city where it will use a smart application to find uh, a parking space very smartly, and uh, it will probably also pay in a smart way. So in this way, we start imagining that these uh, smart and partially internet-based um, applications ultimately will start connecting and will go beyond the industrial space and into, into the consumer space, into the urban space, and maybe into the agricultural space, and so on. And for this reason, uh, what some instances um, try to achieve is that we don't need all the integration that we have been through the past 20 years in NES, where we have to integrate uh, one by one a uh, different plant to a different ERP system. But this, these systems can talk to each other, and uh, in order to do so, we need the service-oriented uh, architecture. And we need semantic technologies that enable uh, different applications to discover each other, to understand from each other which services they have to provide and can provide, and how um, cross-industry uh, applications could be configured together more or less on the spot. An organization that is very far ahead in this is the Alliance of IoT Innovation, specifically the World Group 3. Um, stimulated by the European Union that tries to be ahead of us um, and uh, works on standardization across different domains, including industry. And inside industry, there are many different reference architectures uh, that have been worked on, uh, that, that is worked on. And these ideally would have to converge, um, would have to work according to the same overarching um, semantics technology that will enable them to, to talk together and to knit all these applications together. So that is what we expect for the, for the far future, that we don't have to go through these um, energy um, consuming integrations, but that these will be much more easier and, and more automated. So that's the long view, Anne. Okay, great. Thank you, Val, for this informative presentation and as well for giving these visionary points as well. Um, that is all we have for today's webinar. Um, so please visit our web pages at arcweb.com and as well our industrial IIoT pages that you will see here on the screen now as well. Um, you, you can easily use these pages to stay tuned for new trends and topics that we cover. 
So once again, on behalf of ARC, thank you for joining us and taking your precious time to view our presentation.